He trades the Spage 4. Magnus goes G. F oh my gosh, that's dirty. Because now if you play Bishop E1, there's probably there's this knight e7, king h8, queen e1, and this is just coming, this is gonna be an Anastasia checkmate here. Your king has no squares, and you can't actually get over. And if you push the pawn, I just check and I go checkmate, and um, that's just GG. Ooh, that's really dirty. Um We'll we'll take a look at some of the uh, some of Magnus's games because honestly I have seen none of those games at all. Um, uh, so so okay so Knight of three this first game let's see what this was Knight of six G three okay they play this uh, King's Indian interesting so Magnus plays the King's Indian against him he plays this Bishop F five line uh, sorry Magnus is not through but chat Magnus is gonna win the match let's be serious. Um, I'm, I'm in, you know, if Ding wins, Ding wins, but I, I don't see Ding winning. Just, uh, just being honest, just being honest. So, so Bishop F5 is a line that I think Fabiano, Fabiano has played this quite a few times. Um, so Knight G5, interesting, D5, Queen B3, Queen B6, trade. Now the interesting about, interesting thing about this opening is that Ding is one of these guys who plays these Fianchito openings, puts his Bishop on G2. Um, plays long diagonal better than almost anybody else. Um, yeah, Daniel plays it as well. Fabiano is definitely the strongest top player who plays this uh, Bishop F5 line. So it's interesting to note that Ding is such a specialist when he puts the Bishop on G2. And against something that's objectively dubious, like this, this C6 Bishop F5, Ding actually got nothing in this game, which is which is interesting. Uh, Ding has to win two in a row, not three in a row. Um, so trade takes knight d5 a knight c6 and e3 so white's up a pawn here white is up one pawn double pawns on v2 and v3 not ideal so h6 knight e4 rook d8 so knight c3 e5 takes now i guess white's still up a pawn but it's a double pawn not great black also has these open bishops on these lines um geez i can't draw today what is wrong with me yeah, so black has these bishops on these open lines. Um, so e4, bishop h3. Of course, you remove the bishop. Rook d1, bishop g4. Oh, wow. It's just a repetition. Wow. All right. Well, wow. Wow, okay. Um, okay, not, not a line that I'm super familiar with. I'll probably take a look at it um, later. But pretty dry first game. And again, this is what I would say also is, is one thing that's important when you're playing these matches, and I've played a lot of them now in these various events, is what you want to do is if you have the white pieces in the first game, it's not so much that you have to win your first game, but you need to put the put the squeeze, you need to put the pressure on the dude um, when you're white in the first game. Because when because when you have a first game with white and it's just a, a basically a 20 move nothing burger, um what happens is then like then it's then your opponent is feeling very good because they got the easy draw with black and they have two whites and one black in the next three games so it's definitely their um to their their benefit and their advantage and they're feeling much more confident um so yeah very very unfortunate for Ding in this first game um because with the white pieces gets literally nothing and it's just a very quick draw um so let's move on to the second game oh this was a very this was oh this was a short match only three games wow um uh so okay so e4 played c5 knight of three a6 okay so we get the knight orf here from uh from ding loren so magnus plays bishop e3 e5 peter Svidler was playing e6 these f3 lines in the in the last event um this time uh e5 is played yeah, I, uh, specifically a nothing burger. Yeah, like by nothing burger, I mean when you've got the white pieces, you want to put pressure on your opponent. Now, like if you draw the game, you draw the game. The majority of games you play in chess are going to be a draw, but you want to show something. Because when you don't show something in a four-game match, um, when you have white in game one and you don't show anything, your opponent has two whites, you have one white. It's just 2v1. And when you're, when you're facing two blacks against Magnus and one white, it's not pleasant no matter what world you're in. But when you when you have that first white and it's just you burn it for nothing, then um then it just psychologically becomes very unpleasant. Two v one in a single player game, Keck W. Yes. So knight b three, bishop b six. Okay, so they play this knight orf h five. I used to love this system. Um, and in fact, I remember this. I played this system when I played my. Speaking of 
speaking of Thor, I remember I played this H5 system in this tournament, the Reykjavik Open in, I think it was 2003 or 2004, and I had this great game against um, Sergey Ehrenberg, an Israeli Grandmaster, and I got this great position. I think I was winning, and at one moment, I played one wrong move, and I, I believe I lost that game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's see. Did I lose this game? Let's see. Did I lose this? Let's see. Is it going to load? Let's see. What happened in this game? Okay, let's see. What was this game? Yes, I'm right. It was. I'm right. Yeah, I, first of all, I'm right. You see the pawn sticking on H5. Sorry, this, this looks terrible, doesn't it? This look better? Okay, this looks better. Sorry, wrong one. Anyway, you guys see it? Um, now you guys see it? What did I tell you guys? I was right. Uh, Sergey Ehrenberg against myself. I played this H5 system. I got a great position, and then I messed it up, and I lost this game. Because uh, it was 1-0, right? Yeah, it was 1-0, as expected. So I have fond memories of playing this this um, this, this H5 line. Uh, but, you know, it, he doesn't make this stuff up, LOL. No, I don't make it up, you guys. I mean, I remember games. But yeah, I remember that because it was very upsetting because I think if I'd won that game, I would have qualified for this um, for this, for this uh, rapid event that Gary Kasparov played in. It was famous because Kasparov played uh, played Carlsen in that event in Iceland in 2004. So I'm, I was very upset because by losing that game, I didn't qualify. I think Magnus did, Levon did, and I forget who the other couple of players were, but I was, I was very upset because uh, it meant I didn't qualify for the, uh, for, for the Rapid tournament. So anyway, very fond memories of this H5. So this should be 2, 97, 95. Now the problem is, is over time, one player in particular by the, by the name of Fabiano Caruana has played against the system a lot. He probably had like 10 games in 2013, 12, 13. He had like a ton of games against Boris Gelfand. I think he had a game against me, a game against Lenny Dominguez and so forth. So, um, so the structure, structure here is that basically white tries to argue I've got two bishops. And by creating this weakness, you can't really castle here. And white's going to create this bind and grip on the central squares here with like c4. So b6 castles. Actually, b6 is definitely not right. That looks very wrong. So queen c7, king b1, b5. Again, I mean... Ding has wasted two tempi. Let's go back here. So Ding goes b6 and then b5. One thing you don't want to do in the game of chess is waste tempo. Um, tempo, of course, Italian word means time. You don't want to waste your time. So when you can move the pawn in one, one in one go to b5, then move the pawn to b5 in one go, dude. So he goes b6 and now he goes b5, uh, losing one tempo. Um, and now knight a5. Knight b6 here. White trades, goes knight c6, gigantic horse sitting on this outpost because the pawn guards it, and black can't really remove it. And already, I would argue, I think black is close to lost. I don't know how bad this is for black, but this is really bad. Maybe, oh, it was a mouse slip? Did he, did he really mouse slip? I'm not sure if he mouse slipped. I doubt it somehow. But anyway, bishop d8 played. Now Magnus goes c4. And again, just creates this max grip. Knight on c6. Open line. And the black king's going to have to castle. But at some point, f4 and rook e1 is coming. Or even rook e3, rook b3. And white can play on the queen side. Really tough position. So castles, rook e1, knight e7. Now g4. Logical. Because black would like to play f5 and e4. Ideally, black would like to go the following. Let me just make some empty moves. Black would like to go like this. Idea e4 and open up the lines towards the white king. So by playing g4, white prevents this f5 push. And also, black's king now is going to be open because you created this weakness earlier with pawn to h5. So he goes, tra he trades, bishop h4. Magnus goes g4. Oh my gosh, that's dirty. Because now if you play bishop e1, there's probably, there's this knight e7, king h8, queen e1. And this is just coming, this is going to be an Anastasia checkmate here. Your king has no squares, and you can't actually get over. And if you push the pawn, I just check, and I go checkmate, and um, that's just GG. Ooh, that's really dirty. G5 is very nasty. Very sharp, Very sharp though. Very very nice tactical move by Magnus here, uh, because it cuts off the, the bishop from being able to retreat. So G6, rook F1. What is the point of H5? The point is H5 stops white from pushing pawn to G4 and getting the max expansion on the king's side. 
So g6, rook f1, king g7, queen g2. And again, the problem here for black is this bishop is just out to lunch. And if black ever pushes after takes knight f6, like rook g1, like or even bishop d3, your, your king is just so naked here. It's completely open, and you're just getting attacked. And you, meanwhile, have literally zero attack towards the white king on b1 here. So, really ugly. So, rook h8, queen g4 again. Bishop is stuck here. Your rook is passive. And at some point, there's going to be some max pressure. Uh, double Doubling the rooks on the f file or something. It goes queen c7, rook f3. What a surprise, of course, doubling the rooks. Now, f5 takes and queen g2. And again, black black's bishop is safe here, but the king is just so wide open. Look at these rooks. Look at, look at this bishop coming back. There's just no way that you're going to be able to defend against the attack here that white has. So, queen d7. Uh, rook g1, rook h6. Now, now white plays a3 here. I guess idea, just a pragmatic move. Create a square for the king and um, and maybe just go bishop d3. Again, the position is so so bad for black that white can just chill with king a2. Uh, knight h5, rook b3, knight f4. Aha, so Magnus actually decides here that he can no longer attack here and he wants to attack this way. So he, he shifts the whole, he shifts everything to focus on this side of the board. Now, which shows just how bad this position is here for black knight f4 queen c2 king h8 king a2 queen f5 queen d2 of course black does not trade queens or white does not trade queens because white is just dominating this position all kinds of weaknesses very passive rook on h6 2 so queen e4 rook c1 bishop g5 somehow though Somehow it feels like Magnus is better, but he's gone slightly wrong. So I wonder what he did wrong. I'm not going to turn up the engine, but it feels like he did something wrong. And now the engine says black is better. What? Oh, 96 is apparently good for black. Let me see. Maybe. I'm not going to load the depth, but um, but maybe 96 is, is a good move. Anyway. Oh, no. He does play it. Sorry. Queen c2. Trade. Knight d4. No, yeah, computer's just wrong. It's it's just bad. It's just bad. Um, so knight d4 trades rook b6. Bishop f4 takes. Aha. Oh, well, rook h3 and black tries to make a queen here because the bishop covers the squares. Wow. Okay, so a4 here, here, and b bishop d3. And I guess yeah, now white wins because against the, the again the pawn gets stuck and now white is two g two uh two passers just running up the board here. The depth the depth is yeah I'm not turning up the depth because I don't want to get the um get the deep I, I don't I don't want to have my computer freeze up again. So we're gonna be analyzing with our human brains. No computers allowed. Um, so after bishop d3 it's just losing again two pawns and this pawn doesn't get get to go up the board anymore. So he goes rook g5 trade and now a5. And king b3 and the white king is just marching all the way in to escort the pawn and make a queen. It's just a classic zigzag. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and game over. So there's one, there's two, there's three, and that's all she wrote. Because king b7 and a7 are even, I mean, I guess even something like b4 is simple. Because now the bishop can't stay on the diagonal. And then I just make a queen and white is winning. So... Uh, Magnus wins the second game, goes up one and a half half, and I guess this was a very short match. It was only, it's only what three games. So, um, okay, let's take a look at this third game, which Magnus won. So knight f3, c5. Okay, so they actually, oh wait, so they transpose into a knight orf, except Ding is white here. Interesting. So now Ding plays bishop e3 like Magnus did, but Magnus goes e6. So f3, b5, a3, and this is kind of funny too, because this is a system that Magnus was using with the white pieces against Peter Savidler um, in the in the earlier event, the Legends of Chess. So bishop b7, g4, queen d2, c8, king b1, d5, and I think in their previous in the previous match, the Savidler match, after e d5, Savidler played bishop takes d5, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, whereas Magnus takes with the knight. As expected, so takes bishop d5, um, rook g1, bishop c5, development, trying to castle, f4, knight f6, bishop d3, queen c7, queen e1, knight e4. Pretty balanced position, I would say. It feels like it hinges on a couple of critical moment, cr critical moves here that both both players can play. Um, I'm not sure what to make of this. It, it feels like black should be okay here, though. So h4. 
Queen b7 again, guard the knights, there are no discoveries or things. And you also want to go b4 as well to attack right down towards the white king. So c3 to stop. Oh, oops, 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 oops. oops. And that's game over. Um, yeah. Magnus said Queen B7 was a blunder. He said Queen B7 was a blunder? Really? Queen B7 was a blunder? Huh. Uh, probably because you can go Knight B3 and hit the Bishop of Trades. Yeah, actually, this looks kind of dangerous. Yeah, Queen B7 might be a blunder. But yeah, Knight B3 looks very strong, doesn't it? Oh, man, but Dingo C3 and after Bishop A3, just like, if you take, you get forked, and oh my gosh, the whole house just shatters. So he goes to F5, and now Magnus goes B4 again, just attacking here, going for the kill. C4, Knight C3, King A1, Bishop C4. Takes on E6, but again, Magnus can just castle, get the king out of the center, and the problem is White's king is way too, way too open here and getting attacked. So takes, Rook C4. Rook d2, and now Magnus takes king b2, b3, and again, even though white is up a horse, again, look at black's king, very, very nice and safe here, and um, and black's just going to go knight a4, rook a4, rook a2, and I, I suspect this just lost. Once again, king safety, king safety, king safety, king safety, king safety. Magnus is a very safe king, the white king is, is very open and completely vulnerable here. So ef7, queen f7. Knight takes rook b4, and Ding resigns because he's just going to lose this knight. If king c3, queen b3 is simply checkmate. King can't go up. Um, and every square is covered, so that's just GG. Wow. So Magnus wins his third game, and with that, he wins the match two and a half half. Um, wow. So brutal, brutal, rook b4. So Magnus wins the third match, um, and he's up two matches to one match. Or, yeah, he's up two to one, best of five. Ding has to win the last two uh, matches in order to um, in order to to come back and play me in the final. So uh, every win is not zero point five. Wins are worth one, draws are worth half. Draw. White player gets half point. Black player gets half point. White wins. White gets one. Black gets zero. Black wins. Black gets one. White gets zero. Um, so that's what it is. Uh, did someone just say F? No, I didn't drop any frames, did I? Did I just drop frames again? So no, I don't. I don't think I did. Okay. Um. No. So um, are there are there other online streaming tournaments coming after this? Yes. Yeah, so you guys, um, I will talk about that briefly. Let me not leak anything. Let me open my Gmail in a, in a new tab. Um, let's not leak that. That would be kind of sad. Um, what am I looking? All right. Okay. All right, you guys. So let's start Notepad. Okay, let's start notepad. Okay. Um Yeah, whatever. I'm not I'm not going to leak anything. So, okay, I'll just I'll just tell you guys manually what's going on. I guess Chesby can write in the chat for you guys in case you don't see it. Um all right. So, so here's what the schedule what's what's going to be happening um is that I will be playing in the finals which will be from August 14th potentially till August 20th. Um, so I will be playing uh, in the finals of the Magnus Carlsen Grand Chess Tour from August 21st to September 5th will be Pog Champs, of course. So Pog Champs is coming up right after that. I'm not competing in Pog Champs, but that's up next. Um, so that, that's that's uh, the next major event. And so Pog Champs ends on September 5th. And after Pog Champs, um, let me find let me find the actual list. Um, uh, where is it? Where is it? Um, so, so after that, I'll be playing in the uh, a couple online tournaments that St. Louis is or St. Louis Chess Club is organizing. Um, where are the dates? I can't find the dates. So from September 11th to 13th, there will be a, a Chess 960 event that Chess that um that uh Saint, the St. Louis Chess Club is hosting. That that I will be uh, I will be playing in it, so I can't stream it. But there will be live coverage of that. That will be September 11th to 13th, and then from September 15th to September 20th, there will be a rapid event with 10 players. Um, uh, Templar Rapid event that's being organized by St. Louis, St. Louis as well. So, um, so that that's what we'll that's what I'll be playing in for my next two tournaments um, after this final. 
And if you guys want to know, I'll give you guys some idea of the prize fund. Um, the prize fund will be, um, let's see. The prize fund will be, uh, let's see. The prize fund will be for the rapid event, $50,000 for first prize, $40,000 for second, $35,000 for third, um, $30,000 for fourth place, $25,000 for fifth place, $20,000 for sixth, $15,000 for seventh, uh, $13,000 for eighth, $12,000 for ninth, and $10,000 for tenth place. So, um, so, so pretty good money in that turn as well. Of course, winning this event today was huge, or winning the match today was huge against, um, against uh, Danil Duba because by winning this match, I guaranteed myself eighty thousand um, dollars in this event, and uh, so I have 80 k locked up, and I'll be playing for sixty k in the finals against Magnus or Ding Loren. Uh, first prize is one hundred forty thousand dollars, so we've locked up eighty, and there's sixty k up up for grabs um, in the final match that I'm playing in starting on Friday. So a lot of stuff going on, yeah. Sixteen thousand gifted subs, yeah. I, I guess, yeah. Not, I mean, not as many subs as Ludwig, but hey, who's who's counting? Um, so, so yeah, so so basically, eighty k locked up, and we play for sixty k. But th that's my schedule. That's that's what's going on um, in the next couple of next couple of weeks. Is there's Pog Champs after this final, and then there are two St. Louis events right after that. So a um, lot of lot of stuff going on, and um, you know, it's it's going to be very very exciting.